Uh, well, thank you. Um, thanks for optimistically sitting in on this talk. Um, yes, so um, so what I'm going to talk about is amenability. Uh, the goal for me is to understand uh, amenability of Polish groups, but oftentimes this sort of gets tangled up with the uh, uh, general topological groups, when there's no difference between general topological groups or a Polish group, you might, there's no reason to restrict to that setting. So, um, but the goal is for me really to understand uh, the Polish groups. Uh, and in particular, understanding amenability um, in connection with the large scale geometry of uh, Polish groups. So um, often amenability, it's, you can define it as uh, the topological group is amenable if whenever it acts on a, on a compact Hausdorff space, it fixes some uh, probability measure on, the, uh, on the, this compact space. But of course, compact spaces are sort of very bounded objects. They're small objects that are bad at uh, resolving any sort of large scale geometric uh, structure on on a group. So the goal is to get a bit away from uh, looking at these uh, compact objects to a more general setting or to a different setting that is uh, better adapted at that. And uh, the right notion here turns out to have to do with uh, optimal transports. I'm going to uh, explain uh, all of these notions that are probably not familiar to all of us. Um, okay. Okay. So, um, I introduced this object, M. Uh, so I, I start out with a metric space. Uh, my metric space, you can just assume it to be a, a separable complete metric space. And I let this look at the space of finite. Uh, sorry. I was saying a Borel probability measure. That's, of course, not what I want. I would just want to say finite positive uh, Borel measures on uh, X. Okay. And I want my metric to be taken into account. Um, so that means that I want my uh, the integral over x of the distance from x to some any point y. Uh, so let's say this is a measure mu. So when I integrate over a point x, uh, the distance um, to some specific point y, this is finite, and this should be, well, for all y, or, but in fact, this is the same as just saying that there is some y such that the integral of the distance to that uh, point is finite. Okay. So, um, that, those are uh, my measures, uh, and now I will look at what is called the Kantorowicz Rubinstein space of X. So this is um, the vector space. So for the moment, I'll just look at the, uh, a vector space. I won't put a topology on it. This is just the vector space of differences. So mu minus nu, with uh, mu and nu being uh, meshes as above, so it's positive meshes. But I will also assume that uh, that they have the same total measure.
Okay, so I take two positive measures, but with the same total mass, and then I take differences of them. Okay, so how should we think about these? So, um, okay, let's make a drawing. Okay, assume this is our metric space here, uh, X. And then um, I'll think of uh, mu maybe as some distribution uh, uh, over my my space here. Yeah. Okay, so mu you can see it as some sort of positive uh, distribution of mass in my space, whereas uh, my uh, measure mu will be uh, seen as sort of a deficit. Okay, so that's my measure new. So this is, mu is sort of a resources and uh, new is a lack of resources. Okay, so if I have these measures, uh, well, maybe uh, mu represents some distribution of uh, resources in society. Maybe it's, uh, I don't know, a grain, okay, at various geographic locations. Okay, at a point X, I look at uh, what's the amount of grain that I have stored at that point X. And mu is the distribution of uh, consumers. They all consume some amount of grain. So a person at the location Y here will consume uh, the corresponding amount. Okay? And now because there's a balance between uh, the total amount of uh, resources, namely the total mass given by mu and the total mass uh, given by nu. Well, it should be able. I should be able to transport all my uh, my resources here, okay, over uh, to fill up this hole or this uh, this consumption. Okay, so of course there are many different ways of doing this, uh, if you just think of, if I had finite uh, probability measures, so finitely supported uh, of, uh, measures, well, then I could just say, well, I've got uh, seven kilograms here, I've got uh, three here, so maybe I take uh, three of them and move them over there, and then I take uh, the remaining four and I put two here and two here. Okay? So, of course, you want to do this in a way that's sort of optimal. You don't want to take some, take products from China and move them to uh, South America if the consumers live, uh, if they have uh, a local market that will consume all of these uh, things. So I want to write down a formula that uh, sort of tells me what the cost of transportation is. So. Um, see so if um, so if d of x yeah this is the cost of transporting uh, one unit um, from uh, point x to point y, uh, then uh, I'll write down here. So, um, so for if I write xi here, this is um, this is a difference uh, for psi in k of r of x. So different, the psi can be written as a difference of two uh, meshes, positive meshes, but maybe I can do it this in several different ways, okay? So this is my psi here, okay? So the norm of psi, so this is what is called the Kantorovich rubinstein norm. This is the minimum uh, transportation cost. which is, again, the infimum of, okay, so how do I write this down? Well, I'll ask 
how, much, how many resources do I move from one geographical location to another? And so this will be, I will integrate over the distance. So this is, I will integrate the distance from X to Y. And then I will say, this should be integrated against the measure rho, which is now a measure on X squared, where, what happens? So rho, uh, Um, so rho uh, is a, a finite positive um, measure on uh, x squared with marginals rho 1 and rho 2 such that Xi can be expressed as the difference of these marginals. So if you just think of in terms of a finite uh, space, so maybe I have some resources here, here, here. Okay, I've got a, a consumption. Okay, over here. Uh, here, 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 here. Okay, so now uh, to compute uh, an optimal transport, okay, I'm trying to say, well, I'll take, uh, I'll split this up, I'll put some down there, I'll put some over here, uh, and this one will just uh, be split between this one and that one, and this one will go all just to this. So then I'm gonna ask, well, how much mass am I moving? along this path here, okay, and I will multiply the amount of uh, mass that I will transport times the distance plus the amount that I'm moving along this path uh, times the length of that uh, thing and etc. And I will sum these up. So if you do this in a continuous way, you get exactly the formula that uh, I've written down here. Now. It turns out that. Uh, Sorry, Christian, but what are marginals? Sorry? What are marginals? So, marginals, if I have a probability, if I have a measure on x cross y, okay, that projects onto meshes on x and y. So, all right, let me uh, write that out. Yeah. If I have a probability measure on uh, product space here, in this case it's x cross x, to measure the first the marginal on the first coordinate is to find the measure of this set here. So it's a measure on x, the first marginal. Okay, so rho is uh, this probability is this measure on x cross x, and the first marginal rho one is just to find the measure of this set down here, I will measure this cylinder. And the second marginal over here, row two, it will measure this set by applying row to that cylinder. Okay, perfect, thanks. So really, this is just a continuous way of uh, of writing this uh, thing down that I did before for the discrete meshes. You just uh, you just have your trucks moving here and there, and you ask how much do I put on each truck, and how long does each truck drive from the production site to the uh, to the consumer. Now. Um, There's a theorem, the foundational theorem is uh, the Kantorovich duality, which says that this can in fact be expressed in a different way, namely as a supremum, so this infimum, I'm trying to find the optimal transport from one measure to another, and this uh, supremum, can, uh, this uh, infimum 
uh, can be expressed by a supremum, namely, I integrate um, now here, I look at all one Lipschitz functions from x into r, and I integrate that Lipschitz function with respect to uh, my original uh, my original measure, okay, which was uh, a total mass zero, but it has some positive distribution and some negative distribution. All right, so um, so that tells me I should introduce a few things here. Um, so I'll let uh, uh, I'll write a x. Uh, yeah, this is the completion of uh, KR, these differences of meshes uh, with respect to this norm. Okay. So this is called uh, the Aaron's eel space of X. Um, and now, because of this duality, uh, one should look at the space of Lipschitz functions on X. So this is uh, uh, Lipschitz functions on X. <coughs> so, uh, so let's say phi going from uh, X to R. And uh, with the seminom. Okay, which is L of phi, this is the, the Lipschitz constant of uh, phi. So this is the supremum for X and Y distinct of the difference between phi of X minus and phi of Y divided out by the distance here. Another stupid question. Well, um... You make us uh, an integral using a measure which is not always positive because it's a difference of, of two yeah. positive measures. So you can just uh, integrate uh, against the positive part and then uh, integrate against the negative part, and just jointly support it, and then take the difference. Hold on. You can always, I mean, you can integrate even yes, if. Yes, but maybe you get just negative values and on the other. Well, then you you can. Uh, I'm taking the supremum over all phi, so I can uh, change the okay. sign of phi, okay. and then I will get a, a positive thing. All right. Um, so let's see here. So first of all, uh, by this duality above here okay i've got this the norm can be expressed by an infimum but which is also a supremum okay so the infimum is sort of the intuitive uh, expression for the transportation cost whereas the supremum is this uh, alternative uh, definition of it or by the, the kantorovich duality but what you see here is that uh, this means that if i take the dual space of my Banach space, uh, of the, this Aaron's eel space here. Okay, this is in fact uh, the, the space of Lipschitz functions on X divided out by the, uh, uh, the null space of this seminal. So, okay, so these are the, the Lipschitz functions that have uh, seminorm zero. Okay, so what are the Lipschitz functions with Lipschitz constant zero? These are exactly the constant functions, of course. So I can write this as, out as the Lipschitz functions on X divided out by constant functions. And I'll write this always as uh, uh, this uh, curly uh, lib X. Okay, so that's a Banach space and that's a, the dual of my original space. So the original space are sort of uh, uh, trans transportation problems. 
okay and transportation problems uh, you find the cost of a transportation problem by integrating against these Lipschitz functions. Okay, I don't know how. I'm... Yeah, I can go down there. Um, Good. So that's uh, the first part uh, to set up. Yeah. yeah. So let's shift gears a little bit and uh, look at group actions. Okay. So suppose uh, I have a group action. Okay. So here yeah, I'll write this as pi. So this is a group. So this is a continuous action by a topological group uh, on a Banach space. By linear isometries. Okay, so uh, of course that means that each element of G can be seen as a um, as a linear operator on uh, my Banach space. So I'll just uh, extend this uh, map. So then, uh, so if I view P pi as mapping uh, into the algebra of linear operators here. Uh, this is a group representation, and this extends to to an algebra representation. Okay, so what is that? That of the group algebra. So I take the free R algebra over my group. Okay, that's the group algebra, and I represent it into uh, this thing. Yeah. That just means that the free group algebra, uh, the group algebra over G, these are just finite linear combinations uh, of elements of G, and I just multiply two such finite linear combinations by taking sort of the the product given by the by the group. So associated with uh, such a representation, I have two spaces of importance. So I'll define these here below. So first of all, I have the points. So the, L, the vectors that are fixed by this representation, so these are the V in V, so that uh, pi of G of V is equal to V for all G. Okay. So there are some that are fixed. And then I have another space, which I'll denote V and then uh, lower index G. This is the span of what? So it's the span of all differences. So I'll look at the vector v, and then I'll ask, where can I move v to under the group action? So pi g applied to v, and then I'll take the difference between these two things. And this, uh, this is not a vector space, but I'll take the closed uh, linear span, and then as v varies over uh, vectors and g varies over group elements. Right, so this is the span of differences between uh, vectors and their images. Okay, so it's not hard to see here that, um, well, if I act by uh, isometries um, here, so observe that uh, G also acts on the dual uh, by, if I take a functional, yeah, this will just be uh, phi composed with G. Yeah, oh, I should write uh, phi G. So I move my functional around just by uh, precomposing it with my action of G. And 
what you have then is that if I look at now the annihilator of my uh, of this set here, okay, I look at so this is the set of functionals. Under linear functionals, so that it's zero on this subspace uh, V sub G. Okay, so that means that phi of uh, V minus pi G here of V should always be zero yeah. for all V and G. But if I this, I can also rewrite as. Uh, the phi such that phi minus pi g of phi of v is always. So this is just a, a second thing here. It's just a rewriting of that. And so saying that this thing here is, uh, is always zero, that's the same as saying that phi is fixed under the action of g on the dual. So this is the set of fixed points in the dual for the dual action. Okay, so I have this basic thing that when I take the annihilator of V sub G, I get V star uh, superscript G, okay, the fixed point in the dual. All right, so um, I think I will uh, take, restrict myself a bit here and uh, uh, just stick to one thing here. Okay, so the first theorem is uh, um, it's a refinement of uh, various results in the literature. This goes back all the way to Birkhoff, uh, uh, Gareth Birkhoff and uh, Alaoglu from the 1930s, and there's been various uh, improvement of this and generalizations, but I haven't uh, found this one uh, explicitly. Uh, so this states that if I start out with an amenable G, okay, so an amenable topological group G, so these are the ones that have invariant probability measures for all continuous actions on uh, compact spaces. Okay. Then this space V sub G has, I can write it in various ways. So one way here is I've written it as a closure of a span of differences between vectors and their images, but I can also characterize the elements inside of that space, rather than as saying, well, I can approximate them by some linear combinations of various complicated objects. I can also say, in, alternatively, that these are the elements so that when I look at uh, the orbit of V under G, so I applied the whole group to V, so that just, this is just the orbit, uh, on the, uh, the G action, okay, and so that's some set inside of the Banach space, that's not a nice set, but if I look at the convex hull of this and take the closure, then zero should be there. So in other words, these are uh, elements V so that I can find uh, for arbitrarily small epsilon, I can find finitely many points in its orbit so that if I take the con uh, convex combination of them, I get to uh, within epsilon of zero. So another way of stating this, this is just uh, saying that V is in V. This is the same as saying that if I look at the infimum and I look at now delta of G, so this is the convex hull, of G in uh, in this group algebra, 
Okay, so these are just convex combinations of elements of G. And I apply this uh, representation to it, to this element beta, and V, this is zero. Okay, so the infimum yeah, is zero. So that's just another way of uh, rewriting this um, in this group algebra language. But what is important is that uh, there's actually a certain uniformity to this. So in fact, uh, for all uh, finite sets f, so if I take a, a finite collection of elements uh, v here as above, I can find one specific convex combination that brings them all close to zero. Okay. So if I fix a finite com uh, set f and I fix an epsilon, I can find uh, a better, okay, so a convex combination of elements of G so that when I uh, So that when I apply this beta to V, okay, this is really just the con the corresponding convex combination of uh, these points in the orbits of V. This here is less than uh, epsilon for all uh, V in F. Okay. So I have. Uh, so if I look at finitely many uh, points in V and I look at the differences between a, that point and another point in its orbit, okay, and I do this finitely many times, I can find one way of taking convex combinations of group elements that bring them all close to zero. Okay. Um, Okay, so let's get back to, so I started out with uh, these uh, metric spaces. I had some way of uh, compu computing transportation cost, and then I suddenly went uh, and talked about Banach spaces. So let me uh, uh, tell you why this uh, comes about. Okay, so if if I have G acting on a metric space, so this is a continuous action uh, uh, of a group, of a topological group on a metric space uh, X. Okay. Then uh, we get a, we have an isometric linear action. We get Okay, so remember, okay, so if I, if this uh, Aaron's eel space of X, this space here, was differences between, of two uh, meshes, okay, so if I act, if G acts by isometries on X, then it will also transport meshes on X, okay, and it will transport differences of meshes on X, and since G acts isometrically, this uh, Kantorovich norm, this transportation cost, will be preserved okay, under this action. So this is uh, that action. Okay? I'm just uh, moving the meshes around, and that will preserve isometrically the dis distance, and therefore also the transportation cost. Okay? And so I also get uh, the, so the, the action uh, on the jewel. 
Okay, so remember the jewel of this space here. This was the Lipschitz functions on X up to identifying uh, things that differ by a constant. Okay, and that action, well, if I look at the action on the jewel, okay, I take a Lipschitz function here, and how do I move it around? Well, I'm just pre-composing with the, the group action, okay, by G. Okay. So I need a, an inverse here to make it a left action. Okay, so this is easy enough to understand. And so, uh, so I I have these two spaces. Okay, so uh, associated with this action, I have of course uh, this a x sub g. So remember, what was this? This was the closed linear span, and in fact, I can write it as the closed linear span of uh, two Dirac meshes. Okay, so I'm looking at the closed linear span of the following uh, set of uh, vectors. Okay, I take the difference between two Dirac meshes and uh, the difference between their images on the G. This is for G and G x, y, in x. This is, uh, um, of course, okay, it's some space, but it doesn't really, uh, it's a bit weird, and the right space you actually want to look at uh, is rather the following. I would rather look at the span of uh, differences between a Dirac measure and the transported Dirac measure. X in X. So it's clear that I have an inclusion in this way, okay? This difference here is just the sum of two, so such a difference here. Okay, it's just the sum of two differences uh, uh, of that form. Okay, and so because of this inclusion, I have uh, an, a reverse inclusion of uh, the annihilators. So if I look at the annihilator of this set here. Well, these are the uh, the functions in my space of Lipschitz. So these are the Lipschitz functions on X, so that uh, phi is constant on every uh, G orbit. On X. It's clear that if I apply a phi here to such a difference of Dirac meshes, well, then I'm just evaluating phi at, uh, okay, so maybe I should write that out. If I take phi of this, this difference of uh, uh, two Dirac meshes here, I'm just saying phi evaluated at x minus phi evaluated at g of x. Okay, so Asking that this always evaluates to zero means that phi must be constant on every uh, g orbit. Okay, and so if I look at uh, this again, well, uh, now I get a reverse inclusion here of uh, these things. So this was contained in. Uh, was here. Okay, so that's the annihilator of this. Okay, if I have, when I take annihilators of a larger set, I get a small uh, set. Okay, and by what I told you before, this this was the set of uh, fixed points in the jewel. 
Okay, so this is the jewel here, and then the set of fixed points, which is now the jewel are the Lipschitz functions, and then the fixed points. But we can write this out. Uh, what are the the Lipschitz functions that are fixed under this action, and uh, they don't have to be fixed exactly because I'm only counting Lipschitz functions up to differences that are constant. Okay, so what it means is that when I take an element in here, that's a Lipschitz function essentially, so that when I translate it, it's I'm just adding a constant to it. Okay, so these are uh, Lipschitz functions. on x up to constant differences so that for all uh, g in g, uh, phi and the transported Lipschitz function here is constant. Okay, so of course being constant on every g orbit means that you are certainly that that difference between phi and the transported phi is always zero, but I could have uh, something more. So these uh, two spaces are easy to understand. Okay, so the this annihilator and this thing here. Now, let's now the the interesting thing begin. Okay, so I will uh, define the following. So for uh, so for phi, uh, what's the, what is the time here? Because it says nine forty one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't. That's off. Yeah. Okay. So for phi, uh, one of these Lipschitz functions. Uh, I'll let R phi, okay, that will be a function, uh, so define uh, R phi, that's a map from G to the real line, namely by this here being the constant value of uh, of this function here. Okay, of the difference of these two functions. And now we see, so that defines me a, a map from G into R. And you, we will see here, if I compute this R phi at evaluated at G uh, times F, well, I can just evaluate it. Uh, how do I find the constant value of a function? Well, I just evaluate that function. So let me do that. So I'll evaluated at x and then uh, g f times x i'll rewrite this as phi of x minus uh, phi of um, f of x okay. then i have to remember i have to subtract uh, something again or add something rather so this is phi of f of x minus phi of g f of x. Okay, so I've just added this, uh, uh, subtracted this and added it again. Okay, but now you see the first, uh, the first thing here just expresses r phi of f. It's the constant value of this. And the second thing here, what does that express? It expresses the constant value of phi minus phi composed with g. Okay. To find that constant value, I'm evaluating at that difference at the point f of x. Okay. So this is just r v of g. So in other words, this r v is a continuous, a continuous homomorphism from G 
to uh, the additive group of reals. So in other words, all these functions here, each phi gives me a homomorphism from the group G to the group R. Okay, so that means that you have an exact sequence of, uh, of groups with uh, of vector spaces, in fact. Yeah. I'm looking at uh, this annihilator. So let me just recall you what that one was. Okay, so these were the Lipschitz functions. So this space here are the Lipschitz functions that are constant on every orbit. And this other space are those that have this uh, more complicated description, namely that uh, when I transport it, I'm only adding a constant. Okay, so that's a larger space, of course. So that's, uh, and this was, I could write it out as the constants in the, or the, the invariance in the dual. Okay, and then I get the space of continuous homomorphisms from G to R. So this is continuous homomorphisms from G to R. Okay, that's a vector space. Okay, so I get so this is a vector space here. Of such uh, continuous homomorphisms. Okay, and uh, so let's, this was my operator R. Okay, so um, because of this is exact, means that if this space here is trivial, okay, if there are no continuous homomorphisms, well, then all of these R fees will be zero which means that they will just, that uh, uh, I will get the equivalence of these two spaces. Then, so D, G, X complement, oh, uh, annihilator is the same as this lip X, G, X, which is uh, A of X, G, annihilator and therefore that dgx is the same as this thing here. Okay, so that's a, uh, that's the story. And what can I use that for? So let me write out the theorem and uh, there. Okay, so suppose G is an amenable topological group, uh, topological group. And uh, D is a continuous left invariant metric on G. Okay, so the idea is so that means uh, that uh, so. G, F, uh, G, H, yeah, the distance between these two elements is the same as the distance between F and H. Okay. So in other words, when I, multi when I let X, G act on itself on, by translation on the left, I get an isometry of G. That's the idea. Um. <coughs> okay, so then for all uh, finite subsets E 
g and epsilon positive. Ah, okay. Uh, I went ahead of myself here, yeah? so I have uh, have this. Okay. So assume also. that um, I have no homomorphisms to R. <clears throat> okay, so I have no continuous homomorphisms to R. In which case, I'm in uh, this situation above here, okay, where X is uh, now, X would be my group with uh, my left invariant metric. Okay. So I'm going to use that uh, statement here, but I'll, I won't uh, go too much into what uh, it says. Okay. So, uh, so the idea is that this assumption here, that I have no homomorphisms to R, comes into uh, play by saying that this space here uh, is equal to that space. And I'll remind you what I could say about that space uh, just in a bit. So then uh, there is a uh, there is uh, a finitely support uh, well there is a There's an element beta in in delta of g. So this is just the convex hull of again. <coughs> in the group algebra. Okay, so it's a convex combination of group elements. So that uh now view this as a finite a probability measure on G. Okay. I have a finite convex combination of elements of G. Okay, that is really just a convex combination of Dirac meshes on G. Okay. And then I can say that if I look at this Dirac measure and I shift it, so if I look at the maximum over G and F in E, okay. so I take this Dirac measure, I shift it by moving it on the right by G, and I take the same Dirac measure, I shift it by moving on the right uh, with an F. Then the distance in this Kantorovich uh, Rubinstein norm is at most epsilon. So that means I have my group here. Okay. I assume that it's amenable. Okay. I have a left invariant metric. I assume G has no homomorphisms onto R. Okay. And then I have uh, finitely many group elements okay. that move. Uh, they move, of course, G around. Okay. by multiplying it on the right. Now, they will not be isometric actions in general because the, the metric might not be right invariant. Okay, So multiplying on the right by G and by F will not be an isometry of G. But I can find some probability measure. So they will be some movements in uh, here, uh, inside of, uh, of my space, G here. Okay, but I can find a probability measure beta, a finite probability measure, so that I move if I move it by by uh, uh, by g on the right, okay, then I'll get beta g, and I'll move it uh, down with f on the downwards, then I'll get something here. Then they are close to each other 
in this uh, transportation cost now. Okay, so they will be this distribution of resources that are uh, close to again together. I can't say that they actually overlap because this is not a, it's not a discrete group, but at least in the metric sense, they will be close to each other. Okay, do I have uh, more time or am I? Yeah, yeah, you can you can go on. Okay. okay, I'll get, just uh, tell you why this is interesting here. So the idea is I have a, uh, an amenable topological group with a left invariant metric, but no homomorphisms to R. Then I can find, then for every uh, finite number of translations, I can find an L, a, a probability measure on the group that's almost invariant under these uh, uh, translations. But it, you have to remember that the translations on the right, it's not uh, it's on, not on the left. Okay, let's take a specific example. Okay. Let's see why I need this, uh, that there are no homomorphisms to R. So take, so what is the, uh, the best known amenable group. It's Z or the real line. Okay, you take uh, that. Okay, and let's, so this is Z here. And let's assume that my G, this is just uh, the operation, uh, so translation. By, by one. Okay, so this is just, uh, I add one to everything. Okay, if you're used to thinking about amenability, okay, how would you get a probability measure on Z, which is almost invariant under this translation? Okay. Well, uh, say I want to, I don't know how I want it, Okay, uh, so what, what you do is, well, you just take a uniform probability measure on a very long interval. Okay, so say this is an interval of length uh, n. Okay, so, uh, and then I'll take the uniform probability measure on it. So that means that this is just uniform distribution here of height uh, 1n. Okay. Now, if I take this uh, probability measure and I trans, so I view this, uh, uh, that's my probability measure here, that's my beta. Okay. This uniform probability measure here. Now, if I translate it by one, I get a probability measure that looks like this. Okay, and I'll write it as a deficit instead. Okay, so that is a beta plus one. So I've translated that probability measure one to the right. Okay, now these prob two probability measures are obviously very close to each other. Okay, if I take, uh, say, the difference between the two probability measure, well, I'll see that the middle parts here, they cancel out against each other. So if I look at uh, beta minus uh, this uh, beta translated by one. Oh, so this I should write this. It's really beta g. Okay. Um, yeah. So if I write this difference out, okay, what do I get? I'm just getting a, a positive measure. Okay, which is here. Ah. I get this thing here minus that thing. Okay, so I get a very small uh, measure at one point and a very small measure at the at the point that's far from it. Okay, so if I look at this thing here in L one norm, 
Okay, this uh, will be what? This will be 2 over n, okay? Which of course means that uh, this is very small, and if I take the longer and longer interval, this, this will go to zero. Now, what if I look at uh, beta minus uh, beta g, but I instead look at this Kantorovich Rubinstein norm? So that means that I have the Dirac measure, let's say that I start at zero and I end up here at uh, what point is that? That is n plus one. Okay, so that is the Dirac measure at zero. Uh, taking too much here. So, um, so if I look at this, this is one over n times the Dirac measure at zero minus 1 over n times the Dirac measure at the point n plus 1. Okay, that may look small. Okay, it's a difference between two or rescaled Dirac measures of weight uh, 1 over n each. But if I have to transport this small mass from one end to the other, okay, how long do I have to transport it? I have to transport it a distance of uh, n. Okay. So, um, uh, okay, I think it, maybe I, is this, no, I started at zero, so I should, I am on, I'm only going to uh, n here. Okay, not n plus one. Well, so this is, I, a transportation distance of n times uh, zero minus n in absolute value, so that uh, um, times one of, over n. Uh, well, okay, what did I say? No, it's not that. Let me rewrite it. So it's one over n times the distance from zero to n. So that's zero minus n, and that is of course one. Okay. So the transportation distance or the Kantorovich Rubinstein distance between this uh, uniform measure up here and the transportation transported one is always one. And you can't do better in Z. But whenever you have an amenable topological group which does not map to Z or to, to the real line, okay, this problem vanishes and that's the only obstruction to this uh, thing. Then I can always find a probability measure that when I transport it, the, the distance here between uh, the residuals, once I've taken the difference, is quite small compared that to the, the overall weight. Okay, um, I'll stop here. I don't want to make uh, things more complicated. So. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, Christian. Um, is are there any questions? I mean, I, I, I have one, but uh, so um, can you can you give an example of a group of a group G uh, such that the homomorphism continuous homomorphisms from G to R is zero, and it's amenable and yeah. So uh, you could take, for example, uh, the isometry group of uh, the Eurasian metric space. All right. Okay. So the sort of the I mean you can one can also find them among uh, discrete uh, amenable groups. Uh, so non-elementary amenable groups that uh, mm -hmm. they could be of that form, but sort of for the intended applications. Mm -hmm. um, are the ones I think of these tend to be large uh, Polish groups. 
other cases, if you have this condition, if G is, for example, locally compact and you have no homomorphisms to R, that means that the, the modular function is zero, is constantly zero. You get a homomorphism. You look at the, the left arm measure and then you, you, you define a homomorphism to R by asking how much a group element, how much it rescales the, uh, the Haar measure by multiplying it on the right. Okay, that gives you a homomorphism to R, and uh, if that has to be zero, well, that means that the group is unimodular. So these are locally compact groups with uh, bi-invariant uh, Haar meshes. Okay. Of course, not every locally compact group, for example, the real line is, uh, is also unimodular, but at least the ones that have satisfied this condition have to be unimodular, so that restricts it somewhat. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, are there any other questions? All right, so if there are no questions, let's uh, thank Christian again.